I'll be as entertaining as a dog um, with our capital improvement program, which I'm sure is excited. And I, especially when I say that I would like you to take a look at your table uh, at the huge 11 by 17 um, sheet of paper that is there. I think actually I actually have two documents. One is the capital improvement program, and one is the fair collection item, which is our next next item. Um, it's a little more heady stuff. The the action item for the PSPA board today is not to approve of the CIP that you have there in all of its detail. Um, as you probably know, 98, I think it's actually 99% of our, our capital program that is, all of our capital program is federally funded. And uh, the federal government requires PSDA to approve an annual program. What you have in front of you is a five year draft CIP. Uh, a, a year ago, the PSDA uh, board agreed and we have been producing that five year uh, capital improvement program now. This is the second go round of that. Uh, and so you will be uh, approving the full uh, five year CIP along with your annual budget in September. Uh, that's the cycle that we're on. But uh, because the federal grants are due in June and the federal government requires us to have a public hearing on just the one year, what I'd like you to do today is to uh, consider approving the FY14 column. If you look on your sheet, there's five years, but the first year is FY2014. Uh, and, and what you'd be approving is to include those projects that have money in, those, in, those, in that column, the, at least the, the ones highlighted in yellow, to be included in the grant application that we have to that turn in in June. They, they, we had a public hearing as required by a federal law, and at the beginning of the last week's planning committee meeting, uh, but uh, no no uh, speakers uh, came forward to comment on any of the projects. So again, th that's the action item. What I'm going to now go through just a little bit is kind of get, uh, talk about the overall capital improvement program and how it, it's going. But again, you're not going to uh, be asked to approve of that until September. Largely, the, the CIP that we put together uh, that you have there is unchanged from uh, the last one you approved last September. Uh, there, ha uh, there have been some changes, and I would say generally it's for the positive. The, the total capital program is uh, uh, about $65.2 million uh, uh, over the five years. That's a little bit down, about uh, $897,000 down from uh, the CIP that you approved last year, but that's largely because of one-time funding sources for projects that are uh, that are completed or have nearly been completed, namely the alternative analysis earmarks, which we have spent down, uh, and the concrete settlement. We, we've now implemented those projects, so that funding is not in the CIP. The federal funding actually went up um, a little bit uh, with the approval by Congress of MAP 21 and, and our formula allocation, we went from 57.5 over the five year period to now projecting a little bit um, uh, 58.8 million dollars. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I messed up. The, probably the best news, and this is something that you, you, uh, implement, you voted on and implemented last fall with the FY13 budget, was to uh, reduce the reliance on federal capital dollars to support the operating expense. You might recall that uh, PSPA, or the federal funds, uh, are eligible to either fund capital projects or uh, certain types of operating expenses like maintenance. And for the last several years, PSPA's maintenance department, all, virtually all of the expenses that PSPA has in maintaining its buses have been uh, reimbursed by the federal government and, and because of our other uh, revenue sources uh, dropping due to the economic downturn, we've turned to converting most of our federal uh, funds to operating expense. That is uh, not a sustainable program for the long term, uh, as I'll describe. And uh, last, 
uh, last September when you approved the uh, 2013 through 17 CIP, uh, uh, the, the budget that we approved took, took some of the savings that we had identified in the operating budget and converted that to the capital program and reduced our reliance on the federal program. So the actual capital, the actual capital uh, funds for, for real capital projects is that bottom line, what I call true capital, went, has now gone up from $27.2 million in the approved CIP from last fall to the one that, that you have before you now. We, uh, it's gone up by 24% to 33.6. It's still not enough, but we are uh, headed in the right direction. Um, th this is, uh, that shown graphically, the, this is a percentage of all of our uh, capital funds, our federal capital dollars. The red you can see uh, is the amount that we converted to operating, to cover operating expenses, which spiked in uh, 2010 and 2011, and then we have took a, um, uh, we brought that down, and now we're right, and hovering right around 50% of the $12 million we receive from the federal government every year, 50% going to uh, support the operation and 50% being used for capital. Uh, probably not, uh, at least in this CIP, uh, or there's no ability to get it down back to where it was, say, in 2005, when we were only using 10% for operating. Uh, but it, w it, was a, it was a good step. I would, would note that, um, uh, I was just looking at the uh, part um, budget uh, proposal um, last night, uh, late at night, uh, going to sleep on that. But um, uh, their, their, their percentage is quite a bit higher. They're, they're putting about 80% of their federal dollars into supporting the operation. We've made some good progress on the uh, 2013 projects that you approved. Um, I think uh, it was about a year ago when we came up with this idea to do a real CIP for PSBA for the first time. There was some um, requests, I think, by the planning committee in, in putting this together that we keep track and we monitor our progress on, on the capital dollars. We don't leave dollars sitting in the CIP uh, uh, idle that could be used on other things since there are so many needs, especially to replace buses on time. Uh, and so your finance committee, and I want to express my appreciation to uh, the chair, Mr. Johnson, uh, Mr. Roche, uh, Mr. Barkley, uh, Brian Scott, and uh, Mr. Dighton, that, that they, they are your finance and performance management committee and they have been reviewing this CIP over the last several months and, and, and the progress on existing projects in the 13 column, which is on the left-hand side of your CIP document. So those are projects that have already been approved. We've ordered all of the buses uh, and uh, cars and trucks that, are, that have been approved. The concrete project is on schedule to finish this fall. The messaging and branding uh, funds have been, are, is essentially complete. The bus study, as you know, is about 80% complete. Uh, uh, all of the projects are, uh, th these are the projects that are moving forward. The Wi-Fi on the buses, which you approved last year, uh, was has been delayed because we uh, we started the procurement and then we identified that several other transit systems had uh, pulled back or taken their Wi-Fi equipment off their buses because it had proven to be just not uh, what do you call it strong enough. Uh, one person on the bus was watching a movie, then they would you know come down the whole. Uh, <laughs> the Wi-Fi signal for the rest of the bus, and uh, we want to make sure that this is a robust enough um, bandwidth, or uh, I don't know what the right words are. You know, those of you familiar with Wi-Fi signals, I can probably understand. We have had some delays uh, in some of the CIP projects, and we monitor these every month to try to make sure there's movements. We've had now in our budget, our CIP budget, and, and, and we've heard some comments from um, Mr. Smith and others about the need to have more capacity for bikes on our buses. And uh, there's been a project in our CIP for three position bike racks. Uh, but uh, those are not approved by the Florida DOT, and we have been tracking that. There, there are some new ideas out there, but uh, nothing has been approved. And so that project is probably not going to be completed. We're now seven months or eight months into the fiscal year. 
uh, and so that that project is behind. Uh, we had a procurement for bus shelters, for additional bus shelters uh, that went out, and then the bids came in uh, much higher than we expected, and so we, uh, we, we canceled that bid, and so we are going back out again for shelters. If uh, we have a surplus of benches on site, uh, but no, I know identified locations to place those. If you know of a place that you think could, that has ridership that we should check out that uh, could use a bench, uh, let us know. Uh, so some other projects are, are uh, behind schedule. The IT server room uh, upgrade, a procurement management system is probably uh, delayed largely because we are without a finance director or you're looking at the acting finance director. Um, and in the bus stop program, we had put some uh, bus money in there for uh, bus stop signage that uh, it's probably not going to be needed now that our real-time project is completed. New projects that are proposed for the 14 through 18 capital program. Uh, number one, the Greenlight uh, Plan financial consultant that I've uh, spoken to this board about. Approximately $100,000 uh, 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 financial consultant effort to review and develop a more detailed 25-year uh, financial plan than what was uh, accepted as part of the alternative analysis. Uh, up, and upgrades to the, the PSPA boardroom audiovisual um, equipment. The, uh, the equipment that's back in that back room that Mr. South is currently running is uh, original to the building in 2005. Uh, and he is a MacGyver of sorts and uh, keeps that thing running and we have had and we get complaints because sometimes we have uh, Nixon missing eight minute periods and things like that uh, in the tape that goes online and uh, and people are not happy about that. Um, uh, so there is funding put in there to upgrade that equipment. Um, you're going to hear about the smart card technology that we're very excited about. Um, a possible Tiger grant, I think that's somewhat of a long shot, but uh, we're going to ask for your endorsement later in this meeting about uh, the Central Avenue BRT project. Um, we have, in the out years, we have put money in, uh, in the FY15 column, uh, I think it's $100,000 in there, for New Starts Consulting. That would be uh, contingent upon a successful referendum in November of 2014, but if, uh, if that were to be approved, then we would, we would need to start planning on consulting services to, be, to make us eligible for the, uh, for the federal funds. Uh, and number six, and this is certainly not enough, but we have started, we have put a million dollars in 2018 to replace the brand new real-time technology that we now are very excited about is working on our buses today. But that, that system is going to uh, get old and uh, be outdated probably before 2018. We have an estimate that the replacement cost of that, the system we have on the buses today costs a little bit under $5 million. And it'll be $9 million, we've got an estimate, to replace it when it comes due. And so we've uh, only been able, we've put in a million dollars in 2018. Bottom line, and the, the challenge that we really have is that the, the overall capital program, even that we're doing better, is still not nearly enough to maintain uh, our capital assets at PSTA. Uh, this, the, the number one need is to uh, fund replacement of our bus fleet. That's where our greatest amount of assets are. This is a sort of a simple math chart that I presented to you a year ago that I updated. That, that essentially shows that we have 195 buses in our fleet at PSTA. If you just do the math and divide by the useful life of all the different types of vehicles, we should be replacing 17 buses a year. And we have, over the last three years, uh, cobbled together different funding sources to average replacing of eight buses a year, about half as many as we need to stay on schedule. Now, as the Finance Committee knows, because they've seen presentations, uh, at least compared to our peers and our benchmarking group, we have the youngest fleet, uh, we have one of the youngest fleets out there in the, uh, in the United States. We have a very young fleet. That's a little bit scary. The reason for that is that we bought more than 50 buses in 2006. 
quarter, more than a quarter of our entire fleet is going to come due for replacement all at the same time in 2018. But for right now, we're living off that. And uh, it helped us during the downturn of the economy. As you saw, we took most of the money and took it out of the buses and put it toward the operating, and we're uh, moving back. Uh, but again, the, the CIP that you have in front of you only has 29, 29 buses in it, and we, we will have at least a need or a useful life uh, need to replace 109. This chart is sort of a simple, uh, obvious uh, conclusion, but the, the issue with replacing buses on time affects our operating budget. The capital program will not... Uh, the, the capital money that we receive from the federal government will not support operating expenses other than maintenance, but obviously older buses uh, cost more to maintain than newer buses. A 2001 Gillig costs more than five times as much as a newer 2010 Gillig to maintain and keep going on the road. Last, uh, there are certainly uh, many needs that are not funded in this capital program uh, or either deferred. Number one is the buses. The, the replacement buses, and so there's no expansion uh, of the fleet or new buses uh, in, in the program. Uh, surveillance, the technology uh, will, will um, depreciate over time and there's uh, not sufficient funds. It looks like if we put only a million dollars a year toward trying to get $9 million, it's going to take until 2027 to replace the current real-time system that's working so great, but by 2027 it won't be so great. Plus, we probably won't be using iPhones and whatever and texting that then it'll be something different. Um, there's, there's no money in there for really substantial money for either the St. Pete Williams Park uh, replacement or the Clearwater Terminal replacement. Um, but I'm trying to I, I'm trying to be positive. Uh, I need to be more positive. So I, I would note that uh, we there were projects on this deferred list that we found money for, and uh, we are able to implement the Wi-Fi on the buses was on this list a year ago, and we're doing it. The boardroom audiovisual was on this list. We were, we didn't have money for that, and we're doing it. Uh, and the slime art uh, uh, project, which you're going to hear about. Uh, so we're making progress. The big ticket items are going to be a challenge. They're a challenge for every transit system across the country. But um, uh, with that, again, I would ask for your uh, consideration of approving of the FY14 um, capital budget, and then uh, any, answer any questions about any of the projects for, in, in the uh, full CCIP. Thank you, Brad. Mr. Johnson, is chair of the finance committee? Oh. Not as chair of the Finance Committee, but as <coughs> vice chair of the Planning okay. Committee, I would report that as uh, uh, Mr. Miller uh, described, we did hold the required public hearing, and the committee discussed the uh, uh, total capital improvement program and made a motion to uh, recommend approval of the fiscal year 2014 program to the board. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Commissioner Newton? Yes, I just have two questions. You spoke about the Wi Fi yeah. and some of the challenges that you're having with, um, I guess, people using a lot of the bandwidth. Can we control the quota of the users through, uh, through the IT department so you won't have any bandwidth hogs if you will? I don't think the, the community idea was to watch a movie, it was more or less to emails and return important stuff to make it a productive community. Is there any way we can, because I know um, um, when you say they chose down the whole network, there's ways that they're throttling you down individually, because they don't allow so much quota to be bandwidth, quota I mean, which is the bandwidth capacity to be used on the Wi-Fi. And if they see that, obviously they can't watch a movie. So I think that would be just a little IT tweet to make that work. I mean, we can investigate that. There, there have been a couple of trans systems that have removed their Wi-Fi system because they've gotten so many complaints that it's so slow that they that they have decided that the complaining about it being too slow is worse than having anything at all. Uh, which I'm not sure exactly what that's all about, but uh, but uh, perhaps there are ways that you can not permit. 
excessive bandwidth usage. I, we can investigate that. What I see in the, in the, in the network, and even in, in PSA, throughout the study, they have a uh, disk space, they have quotas. You won't be hogging up all the, the disk space, they, they only allow you so much per, per, uh, per, per, per privilege as you go up. Okay. The, um, also, with the FN, I know you said you had some uh, historical data with other agencies that start using the Wi Fi, but with the explosion of everybody getting tablets and these yeah. devices that need Wi Fi, see, more so it was. It's a novelty now, it's a necessity. Um, that, that might be something they look. And then my other question would be on, on the buses, you talk about the replacement. I know we purchased quite a few hybrids and you talked about the maintenance and how it wasn't as uh, expensive because of the way they operate. I was wondering, does that have any bearing on the uh, replacement on the fleet? And, 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 and to that point, uh, what percent of the fleet is uh, those hybrids? We bought quite a few. Um, we have 30, 32 hybrids right now, eight more on order by the end of the year out of 188 buses. Um, so like 20, yeah, 25 percent, 20, 25 percent of our fleet is hybrid. Now that, that saves us on fuel and they, the, the buses themselves have been very, uh, I mean, uh, would, uh, uh, low cost to maintain or, or no, no additional cost certainly. Actually, some evidence that they are lower cost um, than uh, to maintain than our standard people. Yeah. I was just looking at that. There's not a real report to the fleet on that going forward. I mean, it wouldn't, if you would replace them as quick as you would a normal bus, or would you, I don't want to misspeak, in a hybrid versus a normal diesel bus for replacement. I mean, the, the, the re reality of our CIP is that we are going to have to uh, run the buses uh, longer than the 12 year useful standard useful life and, and uh, can they run longer than 12 yes they can but um, PSBA puts a very high uh, number of miles uh, on on the vehicles that we have at least compared to other other transit systems we know that uh, and and the longer they run the older even when the, toward the end of their uh, mandated useful life they, they cost more to maintain and keep running, uh, just like your car. Uh, so that will hit us uh, on the other end, on the operating expense. No, no, I wouldn't say you don't replace them. I'm just saying, I was looking at replacement of a diesel vehicle for reverse hybrid because all the benefits is to the uh, safety. That, that, that is our plan. Uh, I'm thinking they will run maybe a tad bit longer, maybe a year, maybe two, maybe three. I, I don't know, that's why I was asking that because it's, mostly, it's a fourth of the fleet. But if you got the diesel ones, we know the problem you have with those. As long as we run a diesel, the more it's going to cost the maintenance. But I know that the other uh, one's supposed to have been cleaner and you know, less maintenance. So I'm looking at that first, uh, uh, the old uh, transit mode that we're using for the diesel engine. So yeah. that's all I have to share. Thank you, Commissioner Duke. Commissioner Long? Yes, thank you, Brad, for that great presentation. I'm just curious because I don't sit on a lot of the other committees for this board. Do you? Are there, is there an association of members of other executive directors like you throughout the nation so that you have an opportunity to hear what some of our colleagues around the country are doing as it relates to some of these big long-term challenges? I'm glad you asked that. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I was going to maybe say this at the end of the meeting. Um, yes, there is. Uh, the answer to your question. Uh, you might know, or most of you probably know, that we are members of the American Public Transportation Association. It's the Not National uh, Association. It's a little bit different than the National Association of Counties or League of Cities in that it is about 50-50 private, uh, private uh, consultants and providers and public sector uh, um, transit agencies, all the transit systems across the country. And they have different committees, just like most big associations, and just this last month, um, I was named the, surprisingly, named the chair of the CEO, uh, the Bus and Paratransit CEO Committee. Wow, for, uh, and so I, uh, I was the, uh, like, forever um, secretary treasurer, and I was like, oh, well, I'll never, there's some kind of succession planning, but I had no idea what it was, and then they all retired. Uh, so then suddenly, uh, uh, that's what it was. So suddenly, I was, uh, 
But so yes, I mean that, that's a group that all of the CEOs of the bus system, every bus system is on the committee, which is pretty much every system. And, uh, and yes, it's a great opportunity to uh, exchange and and in every system, that's why when I say they are all having the same challenge with replacing their vehicles um, uh, on, a, on a timely way. So how often do they need? Oh, well, they, they have uh, uh, numerous different conferences, but um, well, we usually attend uh, two or three per year. Is it possible for you to bring us back some kind of a summary report from those meetings that you go to? Because I think that information yeah. would be very meaningful for us to have um, opportunities to understand what some of, how some of the other transit systems are dealing with these issues in terms of solutions. So I would be very interested in that. Well, and uh, that. Maybe what you may be more interested in, and what I mentioned earlier, is PSBA participates in a benchmarking group of 15 uh, transit systems approximately our size, uh, from the biggest being Salt Lake City uh, to the smallest being, I think, stocked in California, and we're right in the middle. And uh, we, we do compare uh, tons of information, and the uh, Finance Committee has just seen a review of all that not even all of it, but uh, a lot of that data and the benchmarking program is really a great opportunity to learn from other people, from what other successes other people have had and what they're doing. Um, like I said, we compared to our 15 peers, we have the youngest fleet um, of any of them. Uh, they are all dealing with older fleets than we are and struggling to replace them uh, just as we are. So we're doing okay for now. But it's you know uh, it's going to be uh, down the road where we're going to pick. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Long, and Brad. Congratulations on that position. No. <laughs> Start with the your leadership, uh, Commissioner Merz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Brad. Also, a very um, thorough, lots of detail. Um, one question I had pertained to slide four, and primarily the federal capital funds application specifically the graph the graph okay yeah the uh, the preventive maintenance um, there's obviously a quite an increase in the 2008 through 12 time right. period and uh, uh, just a couple of general questions uh, with with having such a relatively new fleet um, that what is the causes primarily for the preventative maintenance that's listed here, um, the, the spike that you saw? And I, I can see where you've, you've allocated kind of a flat line estimate in the 50 some percent after. Um, you, what are you using as guidelines for that? Um, overall, can just want to make sure that the CIP has enough money funded appropriate to keep the, the fleet in, in force. Right, that's a good question. The PSTA uh, maintenance costs uh, have been relatively stable over the last uh, 10 years. I think they total around uh, uh, $10 million a year, uh, if my memory serves, or uh, $10 million worth of eligible expenses that could be, it's at the individual transit system's discretion, um, eligible for federal reimbursement. The federal government has, uh, for a long time, uh, uh, counted as capital uh, capital expenditure the maintenance of a capital asset. So just like a painting of a highway bridge is an eligible capital expense for a road for FDOT, uh, so is maintaining or fixing of a bus um, uh, uh, that that the that was a capital asset. And so it's been, a, it's been a tool that could have been used for a very long time, but what that red graph shows essentially is during the uh, strong economy of uh, 2005, 6, and 7, there, uh, there was no need for PSPA to use its federal funds for operating the property tax, which was $40 million more than it is today. Uh, uh, covered the operating expense, and the capital was used for capital. Then when the uh, 
recession hit, the, the solution that PSBA chose, which is, which is not uncommon, was to convert most of its capital to, to operating to replace the loss of property tax. Um, and, and just in the last, uh, the last CIP and then this proposed one, we're making a dent to go back, back to a more sustainable level. That's what that graph shows. Thank it's you. trying to show. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Scott. Thank you. Um, thanks for that great presentation, Brad. Um, quick question that I've got is, you were mentioning that um, we should be replacing, I think you said 18 buses a year, and yeah, replacing eight. Um, you know, we've been buying hybrid buses, um, which, which the public loves, and, 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 and it certainly helps PSDA in a number of ways. But they're about two hundred thousand dollars a copy more than a traditional diesel bus. So, in rough terms, for every two hybrids, you can buy three diesels, more or less. Does it make sense to kind of take a look at that, of whether or not we should be looking at um, replacing the fleet a little bit faster with the diesel buses, as opposed to some of the hybrids going forward? particularly when you consider that the emissions and fuel economy on the, on the new diesel buses are better than it's ever been. And the, you know, at some point those hybrid buses, particularly if we're gonna end up running them beyond their 12 year FTA life cycle, those battery packs are gonna need to be replaced and that to the tune of about $40,000 a piece. Mm -hmm. When that happens, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna crater those maintenance numbers that right now look pretty darn good. Um, so I just kind of throw that out as maybe it's something that we need to kind of look at going forward. It, 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 it's something that we have uh, started taking a look at. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the legislative committee of PSA has actually um, tasked us and we've started to develop a review of our um, bus fleet and alternative fuel choices, uh, including and doing those comparisons that you describe of diesel, hybrid, CNG, or whatever. Uh, and. Um, so we don't have that totally put together yet, but we'll, that'll be coming back through hopefully in the next couple months. Okay. But yeah, it is something we need to, to evaluate. Okay. And thank you. One last quick thing too is, is um, uh, Mr. Long was, was asking about the performance of the benchmarkings and, and that was something that Brad presented to us at the uh, Finance and Performance Review Committee. And the numbers are very, very interesting. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Parker. Um, yes, excellent presentation. And uh, the question, as I, I was just going to mention also, that the uh, question that uh, Commissioner Long raised, we had at the Finance Committee, uh, yeah. seen those uh, slides, and those are excellent. If we could work that into another meeting, perhaps that might be beneficial. Yeah. Um, I, if you look at slide 10, or excuse me, slide 9, um, where the uh, maintenance costs are laid out, uh, I notice that all those uh, bar graphs are pretty normal, except for 2005, and where we have sort of an anomaly where we have uh, very high costs compared to other years for that particular model. Is there anything in particular about that model that causes that? Number one, number two, is there anything in the way of a, uh, a guarantee or uh, fix of some problems that were particular to that year, model year? Uh, we could capitalize on to reduce our cost in regard to that. That is an outstanding question. And I want to alert you that we have a vacancy in our director of maintenance um, <laughs> program. <laughs> for the end. Well, there's a good thing this also. It's a great question whether that, that spike in 2005 means those were lemons or not. Um, uh, when we did have a main instructor, I did ask him um, about that high number, and he did not believe so. But uh, I don't know exactly what, why, when this analysis was done, what, 2005, it could be just a, a small number of vehicles and some major, major one-time event on our engine or something like that. Okay. And the second question then is, uh, as we move forward, are we looking at um, any further work with HART or other agencies to sort of hold together the types of vehicles that we're purchasing so we get quantity discounts and also compatibility yes. issues? Uh, yes, we are. We, we are uh, right now participating, again, as we 
have been in a consortium, not only with PARC, but with all of the transit systems across the state, band together to buy their buses uh, and get quantity discounts that way. Thank you, Commissioner Barkley. Commissioner Roach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm not comfortable with all of the pride, I think, but depending on the referendum, all this changes anyway. Um, so, so once for next year's plan, I'm fine with it. I agree with Mr. Scott and looking at Mr. Uh, Scott and looking at all options, including uh, next grant, which is growing in popularity. Uh, my question I had is on the, uh, under the federal requirements on this for the public hearing, the PSDA held a public hearing, the PSDA planning committee held a public hearing, right? Is that what I heard? I, it was technically not part of the planning committee. It was immediately prior to the planning committee last Wednesday, and we uh, advertised it in according to our policy. Right, right. And, uh, and I would only recommend that in the future, perhaps, that be done in this form of public policy. Folks have a hard time tracking the main, if you will, meetings, let alone the subcommittee meetings and the meetings before subcommittee meetings. So I would only recommend that maybe in the future for that particular step, that we, we bring it to this forum and allow that the public to be heard in that forum. Not that there's anything there, but just policy wise, it would be best to get it in our most prominent meetings as opposed to the sub. You can integrate it into this meeting. You yeah. can just make this a public meeting. We, we, we could. But we, 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 uh, your, your point is well taken. In years past, until this year, they've been in the, uh, on a random day that uh, the only person that attended were me and Rachel. And uh, so we thought to put it at the planning committee so there would be some board members that uh, were there was a, was a step. But yeah, I mean, we could certainly have them at the PSD meeting. So. Just Thank you, Commissioner. I, I think we're more transparent. Um, Commissioner Russ. Um, thank you. A great presentation, Brad. I just wanted to just comment very briefly on uh, Commissioner Scott's comments about battery packs. I think the legislative committee will certainly look at the, the battery packs and the hybrid buses as part of the comparison of metrics. But I did just want to comment that our technology in this, these types of new batteries is quickly changing. And it's my understanding that um, with many buses, and I know with hybrid vehicles, that the, that the batteries have a lifetime warranty. So I just wanted to address that would be something that we'll be looking at because that would be a replacement cost. That would be a big concern. But I want us to uh, make sure that we're looking at that very closely. Yeah. The, the, the experience, um, at least nationwide, has been very good so far on the uh, batteries. I think Seattle has the uh, longest running hybrid buses that are still running. Uh, and they have not had a substantial Fleet-wide need to replace the batteries. Uh, you know, I'm not the rest of them either. So, yeah, I mean, we've, just there've just been incredible uh, jumps forward in the technology of these batteries. So the batteries now are much different than the first batteries that came out when we first saw hybrid technology several years ago. Thank you, Commissioner Rice. Commissioner Long. Well, I must say, great minds think alike because I was thinking along the same lines. Garden, and I, in reference to the comments that Commissioner Scott made, I, I really believe that it's so important for PSTA to keep our eye on the future because the types of technologies that we could be talking about even just two years from now could be so totally different, even as it relates to the cost, that I think to get stuck in any kind of thing that we know now is probably not wise. Thank you, Commissioner. I have no other names. Let's um, see if we have any public comments on this item on the capital improvement program. Item 5A, any public comments? Okay, if not, we have a motion. And Brad, we are approving the action of approving the CIP for 2014 to 18. Uh, is any packet on page? Uh, 11 is to approve the uh, submission of the applications for the grants and to approve the FY14 capital program. Not 14, correct. 